Hello. Thank you very much for staying. I mean, not staying, for coming <laughs> early for this pre-show talk. Um, I'm Kate Bassett. I'm not Kate Moss. The, there's a lie in the back of the programme. It's fake news. Uh, I'm the literary associate at Chichester Festival Theatre, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Daniel, the director and, of course, the artistic director of Local Hero. So, Daniel Evans, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everyone. Hello. And thank you for sparing the time because you're still in rehearsals. Sort of, we are. Because you know, yeah. we're in previews. Um, so we're going to talk for about, I'm just looking at my watch, about 40 minutes. But we'll talk for about 25 or 30 and then I'll open the house up to the lights come up, hopefully. Um, and it'll be a Q&A. So do be thinking about what questions you'd like to ask Daniel about the production or about his craft as a director. That would be great. Um, I thought I'd start off with asking you how this piece landed on your desk and what you what you loved about it, I suppose, really. Um, so I hadn't seen the film. If for people who don't know, it's based on a very famous film that's become a kind of cult and that was made in uh, the early 80s, written and directed by uh, the wonderful Bill Forsyth. And um, it, it was adapted by David Gregg and Mark, Mark Knopfler, who is, of course, a a rock god um, had written the had composed the soundtrack to that original film, and this was a production that was commissioned by um, two wonderful producers, Caro Newling and Patrick Daly, and um, David Gregg was the book writer, and the play it went on first in Edinburgh at the Lyceum, where David Gregg is the artistic director there, and it was meant to come to the Old Vic, but COVID put paid to that. And I think everyone thought that the project was dead. And they, John Crowley directed, who's a wonderful director. He directed the film of Brooklyn um, and many other wonderful things on TV. But because he had to step away from the production um, because of his filming schedule, I think the producers thought it was dead in the water. And so they sent it, they just one day shared it with me. And I read it and I didn't know the film, but I immediately fell in love with the piece. And... Um, and so I wrote back to them and said, this is wonderful, but I'd want to start again. And I'd want to, there are some things that I'd like to work with Mark and David on. I know that sounds like a, a terrible amount of arrogance, but it felt like there were some things in the musical that weren't, um, well, that maybe, you know, in the new life could have a new slant here and there. And they said yes. And um, so I, I met David uh, Gregg and Mark Knopfler and they were, uh, wonderful mm -hmm. and um and then we started on our work on adapting or oh, making the, the changes um, which they were immensely collaborative collaborative on and um yeah and and that's where you, we're at can you say a little bit more about what you loved about it and what yeah. what you wanted to finesse slightly sure so um the piece is about uh, um ex it explores something that I'm always interested and always interested in, in theatre, which is about community and often a community acting in response to an inciting incident that might involve an individual, sometimes an outsider, or someone who's made to feel like an outsider. Mm -hmm. So for example, one of the, my favourite plays is An Enemy of the People, Ibsen. And in this case, uh, there's a community in a, in a coastal town in Scotland who go up against uh, a Goliath in the form of Mac McIntyre, who's this oil Texan oil man. And um, it was just interesting. First of all, very, very um, like, like Bill Forsyth's film, the musical is, has a kind of offbeat humour. So you would expect that when the villagers are offered a lot of money, for their village, they would say, no, they don't. They say, yes, please, and we, we want to be rich and we want these things that will transform our lives. So I like the kind of humor of the piece mm -hmm. that we were coming at it in a kind of unexpected way. But there was also something deep within the piece that was about how communities um, can be eroded by uh, foreign or by outside forces and um, and how, how, how communities, particularly in rural areas and perhaps coastal areas, as we know here, 
they, they can be often under threat. And, and I suppose this is where I really connected with what the piece was speaking to me about, which is it reminded me of many, many places where I'm from in, in Wales and, and from where pe friends of mine are from, particularly on coastal in coastal areas in Wales, where um, communities are often being eroded because of housing situations. Um, so, for example, local people can't afford to buy local housing because the prices are too high and therefore people from away buy those houses but only treat them as kind of weekend or summer houses. And therefore, whole communities, and in Wales it was, it's often linked with Wel the Welsh language, where the Welsh language would often disappear from entire villages that were once wholly Welsh-speaking. And so you can see how the erosion of culture and the, ero re the erosion of identity and the erosion of landscape in this, in this piece, how somewhere beautiful can be sold out to an oil company and be destroyed in order to bring about progress. So that was a kind of deep personal connection. But I also, um, in terms of developing the story, I, I, I asked David whether he would just explore um, how the piece could also convey the real complexity in the argument between wanting to preserve somewhere beautiful, and we are lucky here, aren't we, that we live um, in an area of outstanding that's recognized as being an area of outstanding national beauty. And at the same time, how do we keep our communities intact? How do we keep our communities together? How do we make sure that we are moving with the age? How can we remain contemporary and modern? And um, how can we feel that, how can we, ensure that we're not left behind. And that's something that David was, has, has done, I think, brilliantly in this draft, is to, to have both the complexity of both arguments side by side in a, in a musical. And um, I think he's done that with Mark brilliantly, I have mm. to say. Yeah. It's interesting what you're saying about Wales, because from what I remember is that was also an 80s issue, wasn't it? That I remember mm. all the, the, there was kind of, in North they Wales. set fire to, to houses did, yes, of, yes. of yes. People, second homes. Yes, there was yeah. a kind of, you know, um, a movement which, yeah. which felt like they needed to make a stand yeah. on this issue. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I suppose, you know, we, I, th I think lots of communities all around the world experience this, particularly with globalization. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we hold on to who we are yeah. as a people? That's what this village is asking. And, um, and also make sure that we can move with the times. Yes, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? So, so you know, not, not only is that, it, a relevant story for different places in the world but also I'm kind of thinking when you're saying that I went to St Ives unfortunately as a tourist recently and walked around and just every almost all the houses seem to be Airbnb so Airbnb is sort of a different version of a corporation in a way that it's bringing money in and of yeah. course the people want to move out and let their house as Airbnb but then yeah. there's no one local left yeah and, and there's another complication with the piece because at the, really, I, I suppose, well, who knows, but it feels like we're coming to a period where oil is at an end and we're trying as much as possible, although, you know, U-turns aside, government, I mean, government U-turns aside, um, we are moving to an area where we are more interested in renewables and, you know, getting rid of uh, using fossil fuels. So it's interesting to have this piece, which is firmly set in, the, in 83, explore oil again and, um, and to pit oil against landscape. And we so now want to side with the environmental argument in, in the play that uh, it was important to me that David also explore the complexity uh, because it really is complex about how do we make sure the communities have broadband? How do we make sure the transport, the infrastructure how do we make sure that people can, you know, get to a bus or get to a supermarket? And, you know, those are real life things that um, we all need. Yeah. It's also interesting because I remember when we were first talking about the script and that was, before, you know, around lockdown time. And now with Putin and the oil, it's got, it's got sort of really complex new resonances. It's sort of of its period and it's resonant. And I'm really intrigued by the moment when the Russians come on. I won't, we won't spoil it, but it's kind of interesting in relation to now. Yeah, I mean, I'll say there's a wonderful line, which is if you want to understand capitalism, ask a communist. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you want to just say a bit about um, 
Well, I was kind of intrigued by, because you, you direct so many musicals so brilliantly, what difference does, and you direct plays, what difference does songs in pieces make in terms of the prose of that, but also what you have to, what might be a problem with that in terms of the drama? Well, first of all, t- songs take up time. Mm. So, you know, because music uh, takes up time, then you have to have a concise book. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting, for example, comparing South Pacific, there are um, four new songs in Act Two of South Pacific. Every other song is a, is a reprise. And actually, that's true of Local Hero, too, just as a comparison. But you can see how in, in South Pacific, this, the book writing is so uh, compact so that you can get on to the song. And the song is meant to be the moment where uh, characters can no longer contain themselves in words alone. They need to add melody or they need to add music. And then, of course, when music and lyrics aren't enough, then people dance. That's the idea. <laughs> and just in life, as in life. Um, and so, um, so first of all, musicals, uh, m- the music takes time. Secondly, there's no good having a, a dialogue scene that does exactly the same as the song. So, for example, if you have a dialogue scene that says, well, I want this and I want this and I want this, and then it's followed by a song that says, well, I want this, I want this and I want this, they're both doing the same thing. And so we are treading water. So it's, it's, um, that's you know, what makes Rodgers and Hammerstein the, the, yeah. the kings of this, is that they always set up the moment where song needs to take flight. And then the song explores something further from the setup. And um, I have to say, and particularly in the first 20 minutes of Local Hero, and that was one thing that really struck me, and it's, and it's not often true with pop or rock writers, partly because they're coming at it from a totally different um, genre. So, for example, if you think of fancy making a, a musical of, say, Kylie Minogue's catalogue, well, how do you dramatise, I should be so lucky, 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 I should be so lucky in love, I should be so lucky, 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 how, you know... <laughs> It's, it's sort of the repetition is undramatic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so, or, or I suppose it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like I find the challenge of watching, or you know, I've never d- directed an opera, though I would love to, but, you know, Handel will often repeat phrases. And opera does that, uh, I suppose, a lot, but particularly Handel, I've noticed. So how do you say, you know, oh, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa, you know, over and over again. And how does an actor, how can you um, develop that idea so that it's not just spinning around? Um, But in the first 20 minutes of Local Hero, I was so struck how theme and character and plot were all moving forward in a developmental, um, exciting, dramatic fashion. That was, I felt, masterly written. And we really have only done one minor amendment to the, those first 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, it was pretty, pretty astonishing coming from a, a, f- a first-time musical theatre composer. Yeah. Um, and of course, David has written musicals before, books to musicals before, not many, but they were really working together in sync. And that was fantastic, very inspiring. Yeah, yeah, because actually Barack Opera... Uh, someone, someone and of course it's stand and sing right or they just kind of stand there yeah and park and bark it is stationary mm. yeah yeah park and bark park and better. bark yeah. <laughs> you know. yeah yeah that's great do you want to talk a little bit about i suppose the, the, before you get into rehearsals either or both the workshopping process and redrafting or or you know what happens in a workshop what are you trying to find out or or the set and how you develop that, or either yeah. or both of those? Well, we had, um, because you know, this had so much development work in order for the Edinburgh production, even though we were starting from scratch, I inherited the piece in a, you know, very, very good shape. So we were just making um, minor, minor changes, I say. I say minor, although Mark not, might not say that because he's written three new songs for this version. Mm. So actually, that's not minor. Mm. Um, it's, it's a big deal. Yeah. And we had a wonderful day with Mark uh, Knopfler at his studio, British Grove in Chiswick in London, and with David Gregg and, um, and also Guy Fletcher, who um, is Mark Knopfler's right-hand man. They, they work so symbiotically together and both wonderful, wonderful people and very, very collaborative. And we spent the whole day together in the studio just going through song and scene by scene 
just making sure that everything was moving forward and that everything had a kind of dramatic intent. And there were a few tonal um, requests from me because sometimes there were songs following one another that were similar in tone or um, some characters embodied a similar kind of musical tone or musical sound in both acts. And so we just questioned whether or not we could make those changes. And indeed, they were very, very open. And I have to say, throughout previews this week, we've made immense changes and they've been amazing, amazingly collaborative in just helping us uh, make the piece the, you know, as good as it can be. Um, we also had, after that then, we also had another workshop where we just asked a small group of actors to come and uh, learn the songs and read the script with us. Um, actually, just with me, and then Mark and Guy joined us for the last few days of that, or the last day of that, where we just heard the piece, mm. and that was also then very informative. But I, I suppose it was just making sure that theme is constantly being developed, that character is true, and that the music and the book constantly have dramatic intent, and narrative pressure means that um, there is a proper arc yeah. to the whole yeah. piece. Yes, and seeing actors embody that and do that is, is helpful. You can see it on the page, but then sometimes it's surprising. Definitely, and that's been behind some of the changes that we've made this week, is because when you have wonderful actors like we are lucky to have in this cast, you can see that actually some things can be cut because the actors are already doing it just with their bodies or their voices. Because when you have skilled actors like this lot are, um, you realise, oh, we know this, this line is unnecessary, this line is on the nose, because we're already doing it. Um, and that, you know, again, that's a very fortunate yeah. position to Or be they in. make a tricky bit work. They can make a tricky game. bit work, yeah. or they might say sometimes, oh, I'm missing a beat here, can I have an extra line? And that's not about building their part, it's about making sure that their journey as actors um, is plausible, credible, and, um, what's the word, Consequential. Yeah. It's yeah. not, you're not having to sort of make huge, it's not a steeplechase, you know. Do you want to reveal or not what any of the new songs that were added in were? Uh, no, I don't mind, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. Uh, there is, um, well, hang on, there are three instances where the lyric remains the same but the song has an entirely new genre and new feel. So a brand new melody. Yeah, right. So there, were th there are three instances of those. Yeah. Uh, one. <laughs> uh, well, Big Mac and Gordon, for example, is, is an odd number. Uh, when I say odd, it's wonderful, but it's curious because suddenly we, we have the different languages at play. It gets very Brechtian, where the villagers are explaining what happened the moment the deal was made between Mac and Gordon. And so we're already in a different language. The original um, vibe of the song was a kind of, um, oh, a kind of Western feel that had a kind of bluegrass, mm -hmm. which was, you know, American. So I suppose kind of siding with Mac. And that felt rather strange to me because it was sung by the villagers. Mm -hmm. So I was asking, why are the villagers adopting Mac's um, vernacular mm -hmm when in fact they are trying to negotiate to get Mac to meet them. Yeah. So actually then Mark went away and came up with a, a, a much more Scottish vibe, which also has some kind of Eastern European folk resonances because by then um, the Russian character has entered. And so it's, it's an entirely new feel to the song, which feels much more folkish, yeah. which um, I, I personally yeah. love. Yeah, yeah. And that's really interesting, isn't it? Because it would have... It would have looked like they'd been Americanized. So, exactly. So, which is, yeah. Which is which the, also has meaning. Yes, it does. It has. But, it has. You know, if you want to go that way, it just felt to me that um, they're not there yet yeah. in the story. Yeah. Yeah. But they're also wanting to do it their own way at that at mm. that moment. Yeah. Yes. That's yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. It's also really fascinated by what you're saying about you know you 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 wanted songs not to be too similar next to each other. So it's like it's like a kind of big piece of music. Mm. You know, like a, 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 a piece of music will have a scherzo and, a, yeah. you know, yeah. a, a slower movement. Different and, movements. Yeah. 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 And uh, uh, Absolutely. Because if you can imagine, um, well, it's like when we listen to an album, you know, you, you, I often can't listen to an album all in one go because you sort of get enough of one voice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think you have to be aware of that in musical theatre where you're, 
dramatically, if the songs tend to have the same feel, then you feel, well, are we, are, you know, are we kind of treading water yeah, tonally, yeah, yeah. but also is the drama really um, gathering momentum? Yeah. Um, yes, and if it was sort of sad and dreamy, it would feel slightly slow. And if it was aggressive, it would be kind of wearying. If there were lots of angry songs, it would be yeah. wearying. Yeah, so yeah. either, you know, sort of too many slow songs might get soporific mm. and too many aggressive, you know, say, r hard rock songs mm. would start to feel relentless and yeah. like an assault. Yeah. So you just want to make sure that there's variety, mm. um, yeah. which, which also should suit different voices of different characters as they express themselves through song. Mm, yeah. It should. Yeah, yeah. And then the set, yeah. do you want to... I mean, I've, I've got no idea what the original set is. Do you know? Nor me. I no. didn't know. And I've never... There, I was offered a video of Edinburgh and I didn't want to see it and I haven't watched it. So how do you, on this show, but also if you want to talk more generally, how do you come up with ideas with your creative team about about what you want to express from the script that you have and the score that you have? So it's, it's, it probably starts with just lots of conversations. And Frankie Bradshaw, who's our wonderful designer on the show, our set designer and costume designer, we started those conversations early, early last year. And we started gathering lots of um, photographs and we have a kind of Pinterest board where we can both add photos onto, onto a kind of mood board. Mm -hmm. And when we were looking at landscape, which features, uh, as you might imagine, throughout the entire piece, and features wonderfully in the film, by the way, if you haven't seen it, it's amazing shots of um, both, actually both coasts, east and west coast of Scotland. Um, we realized, we cottoned on and made a very early decision, which was that there was no way that we were gonna be able to recreate the magnificence, the majesty of that landscape. It's talked about by the actors so much, so we decided to kind of have a Shakespearean approach, which was, you know, when Shakespeare says we're in Milan, we're in Milan, and they were designed for the globe, which, you know, yeah. was looked how it looked. And they, maybe they made little tweaks to how the globe looked, but not many. Mm -hmm. And so we decided that we would, um, we would be onto a losing streak yeah. if we felt like we had, we, we had to, recreate literally rock pools, mountains, the sea. It's just impossible. It would look like, you know, we just wouldn't be able to afford it <laughs> yeah. because the yeah. scenic artwork would need to be so much. Um, and also we're doing it in this small space. So we decided that there would, there, there's no way that we could do this literally. So we decided we would be uh, much more metaphorical, met metaphysical in our approach. And so uh, we do this thing at the beginning where you just play around with cardboard and it's called, there's a, there's a what calls a, it's called a white card model where it's literally, the model of the set is literally built out of white card. And it's built out of white card because it's a kind of development of us just making shapes with card in Frankie's studio in South London, um, where we're just putting different shapes into a model box and seeing what sticks. And we were just looking at all our images in the Pinterest board and thinking about some of the images in the play. And at one point, Frankie just bet, you know, made a curve yeah. and we were both excited. And so um, we just you know, were patient with that idea for a while. There were some things that we needed to do adapt about it, but actually of all the ideas we explored, this was the one we kept coming back to. And so you'll see that there's a kind of wave um, that turns into a kind of arrow we have to start the play, there's a short scene on the harbour in um, Furness in Scotland, and then we spend a good 10 minutes in Texas, and then the rest of the evening happens in Scotland. So we have to really achieve Texas, which is, you know, glass-walled offices in the 80s, and then we have to achieve, you know, a Scottish coastal village. So it's pretty challenging. So um, in a way, finding this kind of gesture gave us a way in to, to doing that. And, um, you know, people will see that underneath here, there's a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you go there? What, what, what research, what did research involve? Well, um, quite a bit of research, just reading around oil. And there was a wonderful, there's um, a wonderful story, a real life story about a, a head of a council in Shetland 
called Ian Clark, who did actually negotiate with a huge multinational American oil corporation and made sure that there was a percentage of every single barrel of oil that was accrued and went to Shetland Community Council. So Shetland apparently have some of the best roads, the best hospitals, the best schools because of what Ian Clark managed with this negotiation. And he became a local hero. And he's sort of gone down in the books. There are many, many articles about him. So that was all wonderful to sort of read about that. Um, there's a whole tranche of environmentalism. I, um, I had been to various parts of Scotland, but not recently. And I was booked to go to Sky and Harris and spent eight hours at Gatwick Airport and EasyJet cancelled the flight. <laughs> so, so I was sort of caught up in that yeah, awful moment right. okay. during the tail end of COVID. Oh, not that we're out of COVID, yeah. but um, where I, um, I had to then ring up all the B&Bs that I'd booked and say, so and say I'm sorry. So um, there is something planned next year. <laughs> I was going to yeah. say, you can, you can still go. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, uh, do you, I also, just in the last minutes, I wanted to ask you, you know, as a director, not on this, but for your whole career, what, what, what are your top tips, I suppose? Is, you know, what do, what do you, and as an actor, I suppose, what do you think are really good things for a director to do? Or what, what, or what do you think you've learned to be wary of doing? Or you've... Oh, yeah. Does that... Yeah, so the thing, that, the thing that really helps me is to, uh, to stave off nerves mm. is preparation. Mm. And, um, and so, you know, it's, it's one of the challenges actually being an artistic director and not a freelance director is that the first thing to go often is preparation because you have so many other things that you're dealing with. And um, I remember Dominic Cook saying to me, and it was a kind of revelation, I was at the Crucible then, that every that the week before he starts rehearsal, he, take, he, he works from home and he only preps the play. Right. And I thought, oh, wow, I, can, I, can, I could do that. Um, so, and sometimes I do that now, but it depends how much prep I've done beforehand. So I, 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 um, I tend to do... Um, First of all, it's sort of using the text as your source material, doing a lot of research around it and naming areas of research that come directly up. So references or subject matter yeah. that you just need to read about mm. or either visit if you can um, yeah. or gather, gather information around. Then there's a whole work on character arcs. And so you, for example, you read and note every fact about every single character, what someone else says about them, what they say about other people, what things they don't say, what questions that come up from the text that aren't answered, which is also an, a, an exercise, a Stanislavski exercise that actors do yeah. when you're building your character. And so you try and do that for every single character in the play. And that's often very, very revealing mm. because you get to see where the holes in the story are, where the unanswered questions are, whether everyone has a beginning, middle and end. Some people don't, you know, most characters don't perhaps, um, particularly if they're smaller characters. Um, you do a whole thing about geography. So what are the sort of circles of the geographical life? So in this, obviously, there's a big thing in Scotland. Uh, there's this tiny village of Furness, but then there's also the islands around. Then there's a mention to Stra Strathclyde Community Council, so that's a bit wider. Uh, Stella is from Glasgow, so that makes it even wider. Mac is from Texas, so that makes it even wider. So you sort of just do a bit of a geographical uh, and how does map. That, how does that feed in? How does the geographical bit feed into your eventual... Well, obviously, in terms of characters coming from, from Glasgow, there's a whole conversation about, well, what does that mean? Yeah, what's their backstory? What's their yeah. backstory? You know, are, well, what class are they? Why have they left mm -hmm. Glasgow, Glasgow and why are they now living here? Um, what is life like in Texas at that time? And of course, this is set in 83, so there was a whole um, bit of research around fax machines and, you know, <laughs> teletext, yeah. remember that? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so what are the things that, so period, period details, yeah. what, what was the 80s like? Yeah, yeah. Were the 80s like? What was 83 like? What was specific about that time? Um, and I was alive during that time. Um, so I was, what I was, I was 10. And so I had some memories of that, and I've had some memories of it feeling pretty grim. You know, um, strikes, um, unions complaining about pay, yeah. plus a change. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think some people here will remember the fashions when they see, yes. <laughs> when, yeah, when they yeah, see yeah. the costumes. Yes, big hair, yep, big shoulder hair. pads. Yep. Um, on that note, I'm looking at my watch. I think you should probably go and lie down for 10, <laughs> ten minutes. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. That was brilliant. And thank you very much for your question. Thank you all.